So grace and peace to you, friends. It's good to be with you today as we look at another episode in Jesus' ministry as told by the Gospel of John. Two weeks ago, Jesus kicked off things with a miraculous sign of changing water into wine at a wedding in Cana. And then last week, Jesus declared himself to be the new temple of God and went around rearranging the affairs of the old one, the big standing building. And then, after doing several other miraculous signs in the neighborhood that we didn't hear about, Jesus is starting to get a reputation. Which is what brings the scholar and religiously observant Nicodemus to see him. Although Nicodemus waits until nighttime to make his visit, maybe to protect his reputation. So will you pray with me? Let us pray. God of life and God of new life. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear your new world breaking in around us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, who is our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So I was watching Antiques Roadshow the other day, and a guy had brought in a painting that was really cute and beautifully made of a little girl holding a canary in a cage. And the evaluator person was duly impressed by it, although he was disappointed because he couldn't really find out much about the painter of the piece, just his name and that he was German. But as they were talking about it, the man who brought in the painting shared that when they had first, when his family had first gotten the painting, or when his, he and his wife had first gotten the painting, it had been dull and dirty from years of display, so that the whole bottom half of the painting, which now we could see, had a little girl stocking feet and some pretty wood flooring, along with the painter's signature, had been obscured, had been dark and covered up. But now that it had been cleaned, the owner was glad to find that it was more valuable than he had initially suspected, which is usually the exciting conclusion I like to watch for at the end of Antiques Roadshow, right? I like to look at people's faces when they find out that their old thing that they would never want to sell anyway is worth like way more than they thought. Okay, nobody. Does anyone else watch Antiques Roadshow, or is it just me? All right, yeah. Like, it'll be on, and I'm like, oh, how much is it going to be worth? Anyway, sometimes they're disappointed, though. Those are the weird ones. I'm like, really? Only $30,000? You're disappointed? All right, whatever. Anyway. At any rate, the man, this man was pleased to hear that the painting that he always liked was, in fact, valuable in the money sense, too. So I feel like the story we just read from John 3 about Jesus and Nicodemus is a little bit like that painting. There are lots of words and ideas in it that have gotten smudged over with time and can use a little bit of cleaning and brightening. Um, and in fact, reading through it again, I feel like I got to maybe half of them. So there's more, more with this. It's a very rich verse, but there's a lot that's kind of been piled onto it. So that's obviously the case with lots of Bible verses, but this one in particular rivals some of the others. So John 3.16 by itself, for example, might be one of the most famous Bible verses there is, and it may be covered with a layer of sports fan sign residue, right? <laughs> you see it just up there. It's, you know, it's the Bengals versus the Ravens, and then suddenly you think, oh, God so loved the world. Right, okay. And in fact, in one of the books I, that I read on evangelism a while ago, there was a woman who was literally facing a crisis in her life, she saw a fan on TV holding up that sign. She went to her Bible, opened it up, and read it, and then had like this deeply moving conversion experience to change her life. But for most of us, it doesn't exactly work like that, right? That could be what we would call an unusual experience. So what I'd like to do is look at some of the words in here, see if we can do a little cleaning or maybe replacement, and hopefully find a beautiful and valuable painting underneath some of the layers. So, here's the picture that I would have seen on hearing this verse when I was growing up, or hearing this story when I was growing up. And maybe you would have seen something similar. It goes like this. Jesus knows how to get people into heaven after they die. And the way that to do that is by believing certain things about Jesus, who he is, that he's God's son, and so on. And if you do the work of believing those things and are born again, then you can go to heaven and have eternal life there. Cue the angels with the wings and the harps, right? So that's the picture that we're starting with, or at least that, like, it just, mm, okay, pre-cleaning. So let's start with this idea of heaven after you die, right? 
Jesus in his teachings, both in John and in the other Gospels, talks a lot about what he calls the kingdom of God, or sometimes he talks about it as the eternal life. So this kingdom, or realm, or empire, society, or perhaps you could even go new agey and say a different dimension, an alternate reality, whatever you like to call it, is at the heart of Jesus' teaching. But he never just tells you what it is. He never says, it's this place you go after you die, and the streets are paved with gold, and there's lots of clouds and a big curly gate where a bureaucrat interviews you to decide whether you, to let you in or not. Instead, Jesus describes this holy realm with approximately one million different metaphors and not a straightforward description. He says it's like the most beautiful pearl you've ever seen, and you sell everything you have to buy it. Or it's like wheat seeds and weed seeds all sown on the same plot of land. Or it's like a mustard seed growing into a big, pungent shrub. Or it's like a father welcoming home his wayward son. It's like a little yeast mixed into five pounds of flour. But what Jesus doesn't say about God's new social order is that you have to wait for it. He doesn't say that. Eternal life, life in this realm, can start right now, today. And in fact, it probably is happening all around you already. But the question is, will you have the eyes to see it. Which brings us to Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus. When I originally heard this text, I thought that the sea, in no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above or being born anew, as our translation put it, meant see as in one day I'll see my grandchildren, I hope, or one day I'll see the tree I planted growing tall and strong. But I think what Jesus actually means is that no one can see the kingdom of God here and now where it is, breaking it around us in mysterious and surprising ways without having a total reordering of their lives, a new way of seeing in the present, which gets us to being born again or born from above, or as this translation puts it, born anew. In the Greek, this is a pun. It's the same word to say born again or born anew or born from above, which is why Nicodemus is thrown off by it. He's taking it pretty literally, too, which is a classic mistake for the people Jesus talks to in the Gospel of John. But to be fair to him, this whole thing is pretty new. He's thinking of the God kingdom of God as a revival of the country of Israel as a viable and independent political entity, right? So that's one version of the kingdom of God that he is familiar with. So his idea maybe needs to get a little scrubbing, too, because maybe being born again Maybe he's thinking, oh, if you're born again, maybe you have more time to wait for this revolution. Who knows? He's probably thinking this new teacher is not behaving very predictably. But Jesus is talking about something else, being born from above, being born by the Spirit. There is your body's birth, and then there is another birth by the Spirit that works a change in us. In baptism, we show the symbol of baptism, the, the act of baptism, shows old life, the death of the old life and the birth into the new life by passing through waters and coming up again into the air. So in some ways you're living your same life, but in another way you're living a new life. So there's being born by water and the spirit, which is being born again, but not necessarily with a scripted prayer and admission of sin on our part, but more by God's grace, something that we didn't earn, something we received. Eternal life starts in our own lives, with our baptism into new life by water and the Spirit. Which gets us to the next little word I want to add some baking soda to and maybe some olive grease. Believe, or more specifically, believe in. For a couple hundred years now, what it has meant to be a Christian has been to hold certain strongly held ideas, right? And particularly as science has taken over as an important way of describing the world, believing has come to mean believing things that mentally may or may not be agreeing with scientific reality. Like that Jesus' mother was a virgin when she gave birth to, him, birth to him, or that God personally wrote the Bible and it doesn't have any mistakes in it, for example. And that Jesus was God's son and died and was resurrected. Now some of these things aren't exactly against science, but more like outside of science's realm of expertise, right? Like science isn't interested in some of these questions or can't really give a definitive answer. But it has still become this kind of contest to believe facts that are hard to believe. And if you believe the right ones, you get the ticket to living forever, right? See John 3.16. But 
But here's the thing. Believing in that phrase, as we read it here, isn't about believing facts. It is about believing in a person. Believing in someone has more of this meaning. If I say, I'm not sure I can do this, but my wonderful and loving wife says, I believe in you. You totally have this. She's saying, I trust you. I have confidence in you. I think you're great. And that brings us back to John 3.16, with maybe some parts brighter and easier to see. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Now, the last thing that I think will help us see John 3.16 with some of the burnish off is to read the very next verse that comes after it. The verse says, Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world or to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. It doesn't say God so loves some parts of the world or certain people in the world, but God so loved the world, period. God loves the world. God wants to save the world and everybody in it by bringing a whole new way of life into being in the world through Jesus. The word salvation, another one that could probably use some scrubbing, is deeply connected to the word salve, right? Like you put a salve on your hand. And it has a lot to do with healing. Not spiriting people off to heaven after death, but bringing new life and new possibilities in the wake of injury and terror and loss. Yesterday we heard about people at the mall in Columbia facing what's euphemistically called an active shooter situation. and might better be described as horrifying and senseless violence. And as a result of that violence, three people are dead, and four have been injured. And salvation isn't about where those people's souls are, although that might be part of the story. Salvation is about the families, about the communities, coming together to grieve and to heal and to bravely stitch together a new life that takes death seriously and moves forward in hope anyway. One of the first things I thought when I heard about this was, there will probably be a prayer vigil, right? And that's exactly right. There needs to be a prayer vigil. There needs to be a prayer vigil after every shooting, every wrongful death, whether it's in the suburbs at a mall or it's on the streets of the city, because that is one of the next steps in healing. Because God, right now, here in this place, wants to save us, wants to heal us, and wants to save and heal the whole world. May our eyes be open to that healing. May our minds be open to that kingdom. And may our hearts be open to that trust, that confidence in Jesus and his love. Amen.